Okay, hello and welcome to the 15th virtual history of 2021 presented by Baltimore Architecture Foundation and Baltimore Heritage. This is Nathan Dennis, Associate Director of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation. First, thank you to everyone who donated to be with us today. Your support allows us to host virtual histories every week. And before we get started, a few announcements. Uh, next week's presentation is actually the one year anniversary from when we started doing virtual histories. Uh, and we'll be joined by trailblazing architect Leon Bridges, a past vice president and fellow of the American Institute of Architects, who has worked on such projects as the renovations of Penn Station and City College, and has dedicated himself to diversifying the architecture profession by training the next generation. And the following week, we are taking a virtual field trip to the Cloisters, Baltimore's slice of medieval Europe. And now for today's presentation. Uh, we are excited to continue our series of Olmsted related presentations with the Friends of Maryland Olmsted Parks and Landscapes and the Maryland chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects. And I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer Robinson, Executive Director of the Friends of Patterson Park, to introduce our speaker. Thanks so much, Nathan. Um, and my other uh, kind of sideline job here is I'm also the president of the Friends of Maryland's Olmsted Parks and Landscapes. And we have loved this partnership so much. So thank you for having us back today. Um, but in my role as with the Friends of Patterson Park, we're really excited to be a co-host for this event. We've been working in Patterson Park in partnership with Baltimore City Recreation and Parks since 1998. And we love bringing these stories of the park's history to our work where we provide programs, events, and stewardship support. And I am so excited that today's presenter represents this partnership so well. Uh, he's one of the original friends of Patterson Park. Tim Almager has been hiking through, learning from, and working with urban parks for more than 20 years. First here with the Friends of Patterson Park for 10 years, and now as the Chief of Community Engagement and Strategic Partnerships at Baltimore City Recreation and Parks. Tim received a master's degree in Recreation and Parks Management from Frostburg State University and wrote Baltimore's Patterson Park in 2006, which is published by, by Arcadia Publishing. If you have questions, please add them to the question and answer box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the presentation if there's time. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over and say, take it away, Tim. Well, let me share my screen here, right? All right, well, hello everyone. I, I, while I don't get to see all of you, it's actually a little more comforting so I don't have, to be, have stage fright um, with 200 some people, let's say. All right, how's that working? Good. Oops, almost ahead of myself. So I'm gonna start off by just thanking you all for joining us. So yeah, uh, I was with the Friends of Patterson Park, 1998, 1999. I uh, was executive director from 2006 to 2011, and uh, it, it was great. I, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it was a great learning experience. I get to meet some amazing people, and I'm just glad, glad I can share um, some of this history. So one thing I wanted to say is just about this picture. The first picture really is amazing, only because every square inch of this park is, is somebody's house, in front of somebody's house. It's somebody's backyard, front yard. Uh, and um, you can see how this is an oasis amongst all the concrete that's there. And it's less than a thousand feet away from the water. So you have that kind of maritime history that's incorporated. In it. So uh, why do we have parks to begin with? And I, I think we learned this in this modern times that we're living in during COVID. Uh, we, we saw as an incre incredible uptick in people utilizing their open spaces and green spaces. During COVID, um, we saw an uptick in people buying bikes and, and going on Amazon and buying exercise equipment. That's, there's this kind of innate need to be in open space and breathing fresh air and enjoying these kind of communal spaces. Uh, you know, at the same time, these originally were created for the very same reason. You know, we had an increase in population in our burgeoning cities and the need for uh, open spaces, lungs of the city to kind of get away from the miasma. Uh, they are also seen as these democratic spaces as well. And, you know, again, we keep on seeing these things. Just remember, too, that, you know, Baltimore um, in 1800, there was 26,000 people living in Baltimore City. A hundred years later, there was half a million people living in Baltimore City with multiple uh, waves of immigration. So 
you know, we'll, we'll return to these kinds of themes as well. So Madison Park is just land. Um, it was before it was a park, it was somebody's property. Uh, there was Quinton Parker, there was Kemp's Edition. Uh, and at one point, Nicholas Rogers owned the property. And Nicholas Rogers is known too because he also owned property and another what would be a, a, a park, Druid Hill Park. So, but Nicholas Rogers and his family got in a little bit of issues and he owed some debt. And so back then, if you owed debt, they sold your property. And this was one of them. And who picked it up was William Patterson. So William Patterson, um, he was born in Ireland uh, in 1752. And how he kind of made his worth in, uh, in, in the United States was that he supplied the revolutionary American Revolutionary Army with armaments. And so he, uh, you know, would buy and sell armaments and run them to the Revolutionary Army. So he not only was he considered a hero, but he made a lot of money doing that. Uh, and so um, he, you know, after the Revolutionary War, he helped fund the Fort Mc building of Fort McHenry. He was the first president of the Bank of Maryland, the Camp, uh, company, as well as the BNO Railroad. Where he's also known for is his daughter, Betsy Patterson. Now, Betsy Patterson um, fell in love with and married and had a child with the brother of Napoleon, Jerome. And Napoleon wasn't too hip about that, so he had the marriage annulled uh, and uh, whisked poor Jerome off to Westphalia, and the Patterson family whisked poor Betsy to England. And so that's kind of where he's known for as well. I mean, so you can see this uh, part of the slide on the on the on the right hand side too. Kind of shows you the incremental growth of Patterson Park too, and we'll go through that as well. So that land um, became uh, also a place of uh, historical landmark. So War of 1812 happens. Um, land owned by William Patterson is then turned into a series of redoubts uh, to protect Baltimore. The idea was that the British had a pretty easy time burning the U.S. Capitol, Washington, D.C., that they would burn Baltimore because Baltimore was a nest of pirates or what we would call privateers. Uh, the idea was to bombard Fort McHenry, land uh, infantry troops from the British at North Point, and just march right into Baltimore. Well, you know, Osei, can you see? They couldn't do that great of a job at uh, Fort McHenry. The General Ross, the British General Ross, who had just defeated Napoleon, uh, was shot off his horse at North Point. It thund there was a thunderstorm afterwards, and then as they marched towards Baltimore, up on uh, Hampstead Hill, or Rogers Bastion, where Patterson Park is now, they saw 12,000 all vol mostly volunteer troops, many of which were free recently free black slaves, and 100 naval guns pointed at them, and they decided to turn and run away. So immediately it became a landmark. And so William Patterson uh, uh, decides that, you know, hey, in 1827, uh, I'm going to give this land to my, my wonderful new adopted city, Baltimore. And the idea, you know, wasn't uh, unheard of. There was a lot of uh, squares and common areas, Boston Common to be thinking of uh, one. Uh, uh, William Penn had developed a series of five squares in Philadelphia in the late 1600s. And uh, William Patterson was, you know, had been to Europe and seen a lot of these squares and open spaces. So he said, I'm gonna do this. Uh, it was not only altruistic, but he, knowing that he owned all the land around this property with the idea that I own the ground rent and if I bring in investors and I bring in people to buy homes and things around this, that I get the ground rent. And so it's, it was kind of a kind of early, early community development, I guess. Um, so as we move forward, uh, the idea, um, you know, Baltimore gets bigger and bigger. Between 1827 and, and 1850, Baltimore's population doubles and prospers. Baltimore is in between is, kind of, is, is the gateway to the south and the gateway to the north. It's that fulcrum point where raw goods from the south are brought into Baltimore, manufactured, fabricated, uh, and or just sold to the north. And so Baltimore becomes a very prosperous city, main port, and rivals cities like Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. And so in order to do that, we need to have that kind of civic pride as well. So the idea was to build uh, you know, a park system that rivaled these. And one Looking uh, as examples, uh, Birkenhead in Merseyside in, in Liverpool, England, had done that. So Joseph Paxton in the 1800s had done the same thing. You know, obviously, uh, uh, Olmsted and Vox was in, in going down the road of uh, Central Park. Andrew Jackson Downey, who inspired that and who actually worked with Vox himself, uh, who was the editor of the Horticulturalist, had the idea of a Central Park. So that was kind of in the air as to begin with. And then just culturally between you know, some of the literature around the last Mohicans, um, the uh, uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, 
some of the uh, um, you know artwork, the Hudson River Valley, Thomas Cole and Albert uh, Burstead, their drawings and ideas brought about the idea of the picturesque or the utopian vision. So the idea of creating these central parks and, and these burgeoning cities was a must. And so Baltimore embarked on the same thing. And so uh, one of the key leaders of that was uh, John H.B. Latrobe, who was a city leader in Baltimore. Uh, his father was the uh, architect, uh, US arch uh, the architect of the U.S. Capitol had been, that had been burned. Um, his brother was an engineer of the BNO Railroad. His nephew became uh, uh, the general superintendent of parks in Baltimore City, Charles Latrobe, which we'll talk about later. So he really wanted to do this with the mayor then, Thomas Swan, but the Civil War happened. So that kind of stopped everything, but understanding that the parks were utilized then too. So the, every major park had its own union camp. And the idea, not necessarily to keep the Confederates and the rebels from invading Baltimore, but to ensure that Baltimore stayed in the union. Uh, Benjamin Butler had, you know, cannons trained on Baltimore. The, there was, you, uh, uh, after the, the Pratt Street riots, there was martial law in Baltimore. Um, the mayor, Brown, was, was thrown in jail. So, but, uh, again, all the parks had encampments, and, and Patterson Park was one of them. Uniquely, though, P Patterson Park also had Camp Washburn, which was a surgical hospital. And some of the troops that, uh, that were injured uh, at Gettysburg convalesced there. So the war is over, now let's, let's build a park. So again, these ideas that uh, came through the Olmsted vision, Andrew Jackson Downing, and even Howard Daniels, who was the architect uh, at Druid Hill, who was a follower of Andrew Jackson Downing, was a, a part of this kind of ethos that created this park system. So this is the beginning of, of, of Patterson Park, uh, 18, after the, after the war, in the, f the next few years. And so one major pr uh, big person in this was uh, a Frederick, uh, George Frederick, who had done the uh, Baltimore City Hall, uh, Silburn Mansion, had done many, many projects in Baltimore, Baltimore City. And here's some of them. So the White House, we're, we're gonna reopen on Monday. Um, these are the gateways that are still there, thank God. They actually had uh, gates that would open and close every night. There's actually a park police officer right there. Uh, there was a little casino to your left. You see a little casino, which was con uh, a concession stand that was outside the observatory, the marble fountain that's still there. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the boat lake. Uh, so the boat lake was used as a cattle tank at one point during the Civil War. It was kind of cordoned off and then turned into a boat lake, much like you see some of the uh, the Olmsted uh, uh, water water features in Central Park. Of course, these these are kind of mostly drainage ponds <laughs> and anything else. Uh, and then, of course, the observatory. And the idea of the observatory is that, um, you know, they didn't have much Netflix back then. So this was the entertainment. So you would go up there, move above the miasma, and, and, and still to this day, you see a beautiful uh, vista from there, from the city, as Fort McHenry. And then there was also natural springs. And this was a fountainhead uh, right there called the Taurus Fountain. Uh, actually, that, uh, that uh, bull's head water would come out of, out of its nose. It's now up by the bull circle by the White House casino here. Casino then was kind of a more of a, not necessarily to gamble, but more of a, of a activity center. And the conservatory, a beautiful conservatory uh, that, was, uh, that was built. And so that became, you know, the, the idea of the park. So with this came, the, you know, as the turn of the, 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 the 20th century, uh, more people were living in the city. There were issues around um, overpopulation, dense, po dense population. You see that in Jacob Rees. You see it in James Adams' writing, the idea of the tenement house is not being good. So the need for social issues needed to be corrected in some way, in shape, or form, usually around health, um, uh, a lot of delinquency for, for kids. The progressive era came about. A lot of institutions came out of this, that as well, not only the N N NAACP, uh, but also you know, YMCA, YWCA, and then uh, also for our case uh, is the Children's Athletic League, um, and that later became uh, the Playground Athletic League here in Baltimore, and that was Joseph Lee, actually, there's another park named after him in, in Baltimore as well, uh, and the idea that utilizing recreation uh, in parks to help uh, youth and families get better, so uh, there was a whole kind of uh, new need for parks, not beyond just the pastoral and the picturesque, but also active and alive. So we've been 1900, athletic fields were created in, in Patterson Park, we're on the Eastern edge. 
with that in, in mind, the Olmsteads were invited to come into Baltimore to kind of redesign not only park system, but Baltimore in general. Baltimore had just annexed in 1888, a new, a larger uh, footprint for Baltimore City. And the idea is that the Baltimore Municipal Arts Society wanted them to come in and to kind of redesign what that would look like and then look at our park system and how do we improve that. And so based on that, they looked at connecting uh, park systems together within Baltimore City to create an emerald necklace. They looked at small parks and large parks to improve them. And they actually wanted in Patterson Park to almost double, size, uh, double the size of the park. Uh, so these are some of the projects they worked on. Now, funny enough, um, so, um, at the end of November uh, 1903, they, they send the report to the Municipal Arts Society. The, Art, the Municipal Arts Society writes a letter back thanking them on February 5th, 1904. Two days later, the Baltimore fire happens. Um, and so a lot of those ideas, a lot of those things they brought up in the report couldn't happen. But to their credit, they were almost immediately enlisted to, to actually uh, work on the restoration and the rebuilding of Baltimore after the fire. So there was still some momentum uh, around that. So you'll see some of the work things they've worked on doing those objectives. And these are some of the unrealized things that happened as a, as a result of the fire um, and not getting enough resources. But these things did happen in, in Patterson Park. So kind of the realigning of the pathways around some of those athletic features. More importantly, you'll see in the upper left-hand corner kind of the raw design of what would become the Patterson Park pool. And of course, the extension that happened in 1907. Uh, so here's the pool. So the pool was kind of modeled after the Olmsted vision for what that would look like. Also, coincidentally, during the Progressive Era, there was a need uh, for um, uh, there was issues of hygiene. So um, in 1893, only seven percent of family households had uh, indoor bathrooms. And during that time period, you know, being clean was, and that is to today, is, is, is seen as, a, you know, kind of a character and self-respect. So there was a need to have a system for public baths. And so Henry Walters, obviously the, the railroad magnate, uh, developed a Baltimore Public um, Bath Commission. And a lot of the pools, outdoor pools in Patterson Park being one, were integrated into that plan. So um, this is the place where you would get your, your weekly shower, you could use the pool, um, and that's how that would work. So you see, these are some of the pictures from uh, the 1915 Homestead photo album of Patterson Park. You can kind of see the pool area. You see you know, a bit of what was Ortman's field there uh, in the foreground here with a pool in the back. So again, what's great about Patterson Park is you have two, almost two parks in one. You have like a look on the, on the, on the color slide, you see on the, on the right hand side, the more picturesque, you know, flowing 1860 style of park, uh, reminiscence of the Olmstead. And then on the, the left hand side, the more active use of the side of the park as well. So you almost have two parks in one, which is amazing for 137 acres. These are some of the major entrance ways that were, uh, that were developed. That's the one over, um, on Linwood Avenue, that's a great picture of there. These are just some historical pictures of usage, and they're still fishing in, in Patterson Park Boat Lake. And this is an interesting feature here, too. There actually used to be a music, a larger music pavilion there that was uh, built in the 18, uh, 1920s. Um, they were one of the first radio concerts was was done out of there. Unfortunately, and we'll talk about it later, it burned down in the 1970s. So again, you see the, the two sides of the park. So normally this is you know, you, you, when you would kind of stop the, and talk, you know, end the program, but I wanted to kind of update some of the issues from moving forward. So um, recreation, oops, recreation and parks um, integrated. So the Playground Athletic League, uh, Athletic League was a, a civic organization. And then in the 1940s, it was integrated into recreation parks. So recreation parks became recreation parks after that. Uh, one thing I want to mention too, everything we've talked about so far, there's a fallacy. And there's a fallacy is democratization of parks because there was a whole segment of the, of the community that was not allowed in many of our parks. And that was due to uh, the fallacy of separate but equal. Um, and thankfully, because of the, of the amazing work like groups like the Monumental Golf Club and African American Golf Club 
as well as the Progressive Tennis League that stood, did the sit-ins and, and, and at Druid Hill Park around the tennis, the clay tennis courts, as well as Dr. Bernard Harris, who was the only African-American that sat on the parks board that, that pushed, the, that, that same parks board that pushed for segregation. Uh, they were the ones that championed the, 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 the removal of that. Um, also know that during, after World War II, there was a huge suburban, suburbanization and a lot, a lot of that decline in population affected the, the, the de-investment of public parks in Baltimore City, as well as all major cities as well. And what made it possible to kind of get back on its feet was community activism, as well as something called program open space, which is a dedicated transfer tax uh, that goes towards the capital reinvestment of public parks in Baltimore City. Uh, it was that's huge leaps and bounds. And what we what we encountered, what the community encountered in the 1990s was just this disrepair, those kind of shadows of disinvestment uh, uh, and the idea that the community came together through a master planning process, working with recreation parks, to identify the issues and utilize program open space to fix it. The issue we found, though, is that not enough just to fix it. But the next step is operation, maintenance and programming to sustain those same investments so that 10 years later, you don't have to ask for more money is that you progressively maintain something and it's going to get, uh, continue. And that's the next challenge, uh, I think, for any agency. So the Olmstead legacy, how does it persist? It's through that, just that. It's that master planning process through partners with the you know, Friends of Patterson Park uh, and Baltimore City Rec and Parks, uh, looking at not only the capital, but how do we continue to operate and maintain and program these spaces? What's great about Patterson Park is that duality of, uh, of the pastoral as well as the active spaces. And again, every day we're being approached by new ideas, which are great. When somebody just came to us and then talked about Frisbee golf courses there, um, why not? You know, we'll, we'll, we'll play around with the idea. Um, and what's needed the next step for any of these things is continued conversation and advocacy for these things. I think somebody said to me a long time ago that the love of parks is, uh, is a mile wide, but an inch deep sometimes. And we have to kind of change that. So that understanding that those things that we learned during COVID, the necessities for parks and open spaces, we need to work together to make sure those things continue to happen. And that's why we can have the best backyard in Baltimore. And I think I, I think hand it over to this here. This is the, this is the shameless self-promotion slide, I think for all of us, all right? Nathan? All right, I'm going to actually come back on, Tim. We had a couple questions come up. So we have some folks that are interested in knowing where things were. Um, mm. Let me first go back. If you can show us yeah. a little bit more clearly where Camp Washburn was. Yes. Um, and yes. then the other question was when we were looking at some of the pool um, historical areas, there were seven rectangular pads or buildings to the northwest of the monument and south of the pool. If you could just talk a little bit yeah. about where those were. First, I have to apologize. I mean, it's, uh, this was like a complete wind sprint, you know. So I, I, had, I had 20 minutes for 300 uh, years of history. So uh, I, I'm sorry if I didn't get nitty gritty on, on many things. So can you see my cursor by any chance? Can you see that? I can see it, Tim. Um, I think if you can, yes, I think. Good. So you look at Camp Washburn is all right here, right by the White House. Okay. This whole area was the Civil War encampment right here. So it's um, the northwest corner, right? North exactly, of Lombard Street. Exactly. There's still a little circle in the middle there that I think was a part of the promenade of that mm -hmm. camp. Because if you look at some of the old pictures of it, there's a, there's a series, there's four circles. There's a central middle circle where the, where the flagpole was, and there's four on the outside. I think that might be actually one of them. Mm -hmm. Now, you're talking about the pool facility, which was down here. Yeah. And in the historical photos, there were, there were some structures to the northwest of the monument maybe the Pulaski Monument, but south of the pool. Hmm. So, so the way the pool was, let me go back there to the pool. Or maybe they were looking at this one. I'm sorry. Um, let's see. So there's, so the, the main part of the pool, uh, trying to get a pitch, good pitch, actually a better picture. So the main part of the pool was this, okay? This is where the, you see where these kids are walking in, they're walking in and they're going in. This is the, the main thing. So the idea was that they would actually ship in sand. Uh, and they would fill it full of water. There's no recirculation here, so don't think about it. But there's a lot of water going in there, and they're doing it. Each of these wings, one was a girl's wing, and one was a boy's wing. Uh, and so at these wings, maybe is what they saw. And actually, remember, I think you remember, Jennifer, too. We, at one point, we had to make a decision about this building, and it was, got, it was torn down. And there was ideas of maybe fixing it up and doing something with it, and it never transpired. But it's a really cool building. Um, 
I'm not sure if that answers the question. Oh, I've got it. Um, here we go. Um, there's in the chat here. Um, so the seven structures uh, south of the pool buildings um, is what our question is. We can come back to that too. We have mm -hmm. a couple other questions that I think are answered pretty um, quickly. When you walk along the park on Patterson Park Avenue, the park is lined by a low concrete barrier that has holes every mm -hmm. few inches. Was that mm -hmm. for a fence? Yeah, it was a fence. You can see those little holes in it. Now, what I understand um, is that that metal, that was all the metal in the park around the fences was used for World War II. It was reclaimed to use for ammunitions or whatever. So that's, that's right. And that's what, if you look at those, there's little holes in them. Uh, and you can see where those posts were. And Tim, can you talk about, was there a period when the pool in Patterson Park was racially segregated? Yes. And if so, was there a separate but equal oh, pool? There was not. There was not. So Druid Hill did. Uh, Druid Hill had two pools. Patterson never did. But Patterson Park pool was segregated? It was no, I, I, I don't know exactly how it was or if it was. I would, I know for a fact that there's not a separate pool, which leads, for me, uh, leads, leads me to think that it, that wasn't allowed at all, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, I've read, unfortunately, I mean, I, I mean fortunately, unfortunately, I, I've read the parks, the, so the parks board wrote minutes and I've read them from 1946 to 1951. And there's no doubt in my mind that, that there wasn't a separate pool that they did, that they weren't allowed. Okay, uh, another question. Um, there's a question about past or current efforts to close Linwood which crosses the park. Um, I can talk about that if, you, but if you'd like to take a run at that first, Tim. What about it? closing it? Have there been efforts to do that? Um, not until recently. No, I mean, I've not, I haven't heard. I mean, only because that's a, a big thoroughfare for people to come through. And I mean, I, I, I used to live right around that park and um, yeah, it's hard to get parking. I, I sometimes I lived over in Madeira at one point. And I had to park on Linwood sometimes. The parking was so bad just to walk, just to get home at night. So. <laughs> um, and I can say there was part the Linwood Avenue was closed temporarily uh, during the pandemic as part of the slow streets movement uh, and designed to kind of increase opportunities for recreation in that space and opportunities for distancing. Um, I think it had mixed feedback and that was, I believe a department of transportation program Linwood has since been reopened um, and they, you know, are trying the slow streets movement in, in sort of areas around the park, but definitely the recreational aspect of the park was why they chose to try that with Linwood Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, there's a good question too about new directions for Patterson Park and the history influencing the planning. Um, you know, I would say, if Tim's comfortable with it, one of the great things is that we had the opportunity to work in partnership with Rec and Parks to do a new master plan for the park in 2016. And that process was really um, community engaged. The, the process was 2015, but we adopted it in 2016. And I think these, you know, the, the history that we know has um, influenced some of that. So Tim talked about the entrances and we are currently working with uh, Rec and Parks on redoing several of the entrances and making them more of a community amenity. Those are often adopted by um, groups in the area that, that help maintain them. Um, and I think making sure, as Tim mentioned, that the maintenance and history is sort of acknowledged. Um, the Boat Lake is going to be receiving an overhaul that it has needed for many years and sort of making sure that um, you know, some of these assets that the park has are maintained and understood. I think at the Friends, we're really interested always in understanding the history and opportunities to engage with that. Our newly renovated space is going to have room for a visitor center where we can hopefully have more interpretation of park spaces. And then we're playing with the idea of a mobile visitor center that we could take resources around in the park um, and try to get that out. But we're gonna have a space that we can hopefully get into um, and, and understand and dig into and present more information on this. So I think on a lot of levels from what you see to what we're able to talk about, the history will be influencing our work. And, and just just to point out too, just beyond Patterson Park too, and system wide, I, mean, I think our department um, is thinking it through an equity lens all the time. So a lot of so a lot of these investments that are coming to Baltimore City, we're looking at system wide and what areas of the city had necessarily been invested. And I think 
again, we just talked about before the ground of the call, Cahill Rec Center is the rec center Baltimore deserves. It's beautiful, glass, not a post-apocalyptic bunker. It's, it's inviting, it's pleasing, it's child-friendly. And it's in, a, in an area that traditionally had not gotten an investment. Another place we're doing is in Cherry Hill and Middle Branch, where there's an entire $20 million project that's being put, put in there. And again, that community has long deserved, needed something of this level, and they're getting it. So when, you know, when we talk about these questions of equity, we do think system-wide as well. Tim, there's a couple of questions, if we can get to them. Um, a couple of questions related to the conservatory and its location. Yep. Um, it's coming up in a couple of different questions with right. where it was. And then there's a question about the building that was at the end of the promenade. And I think that was the conservatory. Um, I don't know if we're able to do that. Um, yeah. You know, the conservatory, so you know the long pathway, right? So you go bottom of Pagoda Hill, you go past the stage, and you're looking towards the boat lake, and you have the, on the, on the right-hand side, you have a long promenade that every time back in the day, we would try to weed it the next week of before it weeds again. Um, it's a beautiful pathway. So that's kind of here, okay? Where am I going? Where am I going, Tim? Here you go. There it is. So you go down that, that's a, that's the promenade there. So you keep on going, keep on going. So almost right next to the new playground, well, the newish playground, comparatively, uh, it, that's where it was. There's that larger green open space there. Actually, if you look at a Google fo uh, a photo of Patterson Park and look at that area, you can still see the outline of the conservatory. Whatever, there's a foundation or something down that's like looking at an old Mayan temple or something like that. Uh, but if you look along that promenade, that's what this is that promenade. The bottom picture is that promenade. The conservatory was right there. It was initially built in wood and then in 1904 was made in metal. Again, you know, it's a glass building over time it, and then no one took care of it. And in 1948, for fear of it hurting somebody, it was actually torn down. Um, there was, and then, you know, the conservatory of Druid Hill Park, a lot of the plants that populated that when it was built in 1888 came from uh, this, this conservatory, which was first built. Um, a question to hear. Um, so I've got lots of good questions. Um, we wish we could be here for a couple hours doing this. Um, maybe we can look at ways the friends can do a little bit more in depth on this. Um, uh, Tim, we are asked a little bit about the origin of the Pagoda's design. And then I have one more question after that. That'll yeah, be I mean, if you got so yes. Yeah, so during the Gilded Age, Victorian Age, colonial age in many ways, there was a lot of uh, exploration. I'm thinking of like uh, Darwin and travel journals and things like that. So people went different places. Uh, and so when they, so when Darwin found a cool critter, he'd bring it back to the United States. Well, it doesn't really, you know, polar bear doesn't do really, really good in Baltimore. So you created a zoo, a menagerie. Same thing if you went down to Brazil and found an, a, a, an exotic orchid, you'd bring it back to Baltimore. Well, it's not going to live that well, so you build a conservatory in order to house that thing. So they were also in, 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 in finding new different forms of architecture and art and beauty and cultural different differences. And they somehow wanted to integrate those things into American culture. Um, and so there's an inspiration part of it as well, where you know, whether it be a Moorish temple or um, you know, a Turkish design, or in this case, you know, an Asian motif, how do you integrate that into park system? And it's usually done through the pavilions. And so not only in Baltimore, but also in, in park systems like in Philadelphia and in St. Louis, a lot of those you know, different looking other than you know, your typical colonial building, those other motifs, cultural uh, um, artwork, that inspiration, kind of transformed some of those art pieces in, uh, in our park system, in those pavilions. So you see it, you know, we had uh, back in, in Druid Hill Park, used to have a music, a music pavilion. They, they called it the Onion because the top of it looked like a Turkish temple. Um, and that was the same thing with the, with the pagoda as well. So the, the, again, the original name of it is the observatory. I think colloquially was called a pagoda. But again, that, that motif um, was inspired artistically through seeing other cultures and their architectural designs. And uh, what, the last question we're, we've been looking backwards, what do you see? We had a question about some, some needs in parks don't change, um, but some things emerge as new needs. Um, and specifically, uh, Corey's asking, kind of mentioning what are new new things that have emerged more recently as needs, um, in particular, things like 
amenities for dogs or things like that? What do you see <laughs> in the landscape? I'm I'm seeing that sure yeah I mean I'm also seeing things that we have also we have not done uh, inclusion so a lot of our facilities a lot of our features aren't ADA compliant and we need to get there and so uh, how you know playgrounds with uh, with swings that are good for children that might have you know handicaps um, uh, there's a lot of other things we need to do to be more inclusionary. And I think that's, I mean, we, we have to do that as a society. And so I think we need to do that more of that in a park. Uh, you know, for Patterson Park too, there's, there's, certain, there's a certain amount of carrying capacity. Even though it's 137 acres, there, it's a, there's still a finite space. And so we have to figure out, you know, where things can fit and how things work together in these park systems. And I think it, it came up in the comments that, um, you know, some of our entrances in Patterson Park could be made more accessible and accessibility really benefits everybody. Exactly. Um, and I do think that is a focus as we look ahead. Um, you know, that was one of our, it, the impetus for us doing one of the pieces of doing the renovation in our offices is now we are ADA accessible and um, hope to continue to look at ways to do that. Um, I think Nathan, that's, probably our time, um, unless you want us to. I think a breath. <laughs> well, why, do you, why don't we do one more question, Jennifer? No. All right. Um, so there's some questions about funding. So some of these questions have come up and I think we can, we can continue to do this. Nathan, I think we can do another one, but they, they're not quite as related here. Um, there's a question about burying Harris Creek. Yeah, it is. It is, it is right now. So, yeah, it, it was navigable in the, in the 1600s at one point, and then through siltation and everything like that, it just kind of just got muddy and nasty, kind of like the Jones Falls, really. And so at one point in the 70s, it was culverted under. So it's still there, but it's just underground. And supposedly the outfall is south of uh, the, the, the Safeway. Uh, there, you know, down by the, the houses down there, the, the condos down there. That's the outfall for it. So it does still exist. It's just underground. All right. Um, and let's see. Um, uh, yeah, here. Um, oh, and could we put the slide up with the historic links on the last slide yeah. um, uh, back up? That's right. We should, do, we should always end on the self exchanges promotion, right? Absolutely. There you go. Let's do it here. There you go. Uh, all right. And I do. And uh, as you look at this, we had one. I'll, I can answer this question. The history of the sculptures in the park extension. Um, there were dinosaur-like sculptures, and they changed over to house-like sculptures. Um, that These installations have actually been uh, done in partnership with places like Highland Town Arts and the Southeast CDC. And um, the history of the public art there, it's been a, a couple different processes. And I think um, right now it's a combination of things that come and stay. Um, all of these are generally designed to not be permanent. Some of them are more beloved by the community and some of them um, you know, have different kinds of uh, reactions. And so we're, we're always assessing that, but those are generally done through uh, some of the larger organizations like BOPA and Highland Town Arts, and then we can play a role in those. Those, had, those have had community input when the selections are made. So um, I, no plans currently to change them, I don't believe. All right, so I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Nathan. Is John's okay? We're like a 10 minutes over, is he all right? Yeah, <laughs> I, think it's, I think he's happy that we're, uh, we're ending it by 140. Thank you, Tim, for this great presentation. And I, I saw a few questions about um, about the recording, and you'll be able to find that on um, our YouTube page. Uh, if you search for Baltimore Architecture Foundation, you can find that. There's also a link there. Should have the recording up um, by uh, the end of the day today. And I hope you can join us again um, next week for a presentation with Architect Leon Bridges. Thanks for joining us. Thank you all. Have a good weekend.